Uh, my name is Paul E. Kins and I'm director of the UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources and a professor here of Resources and Environmental Policy. Uh, also a member of the uh, European Resource Efficiency Platform, which is through, um, that, that was how I uh, met and got to know uh, our main speaker tonight. One apology in that uh, Minister of State, Dan Rogerson, who'd been due to be with us, uh, there is an urgent parliamentary vote in the House of Commons tonight, and as you will know, urgent parliamentary votes allow no absentees. So he's unable to be with us, but he sent uh, a senior official from DEFRA uh, to deliver the address that he was going to give you. So that's great. Thank you very much, Jonathan Tilson. Um, but it's now my pleasure really to turn uh, the proceedings over to the UCL Provost, Professor Michael Arthur, who is going to welcome our speakers and indeed welcome you all to UCL. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it is indeed my very great pleasure to welcome you all to uh, this lecture this evening, uh, and in particular to welcome uh, our uh, speaker, Dr. Janos Potocznik, um, to uh, give this uh, lecture. Uh, it is uh, an incredibly uh, important subject, uh, and I just wanted to say a few words about it, but just before I do that, let me also welcome Jonathan uh, Tilson, who's the Head of Sustainable Business from uh, DEFRA, uh, who uh, has been catapulted into appearing this evening uh, because the Minister has had to uh, take part uh, in the vote. So Jonathan, a big welcome to you. I'm going to come back to you in a, in a, in a moment. So um, what would we say about this subject? Well, our, our, our use of natural resources and uh, how much we use and also uh, how we use them in the context of a growing uh, population and the intensifying uh, context of climate change is uh, clearly one of the biggest challenges that uh, humanity faces. Uh, so there's certainly a need to look at new models for economic growth and new ways of using uh, and uh, reusing uh, resources. Now, our speaker tonight, Janusz Potocznik, is the Commissioner for the Environment at the European Commission and a very uh, distinguished figure uh, in the field. He has worked tirelessly to get across the economic importance of resources uh, and the environment, and he's achieved uh, the adoption of the topic of resource efficiency um, as a key flagship initiative of the European Union's Europe 2020 strategy, and he's also produced a roadmap to show how the EU can greatly increase the productivity of its natural resources through to 2030 uh, and beyond. Uh, the Commission's communication on uh, that circular economy will be published, uh, I believe, on the 18th of June. Uh, here at uh, UCL, I think we have three ways in which we feel that we're uh, bringing our expertise to bear on uh, these complex issues. Uh, and the first, of course, is Paul's unit, the UCL Institute for Sustainable uh, Resources, and they're obviously undertaking research to, pro to promote <coughs> the uh, globally sustainable use of natural resources uh, and to provide a cross-disciplinary uh, forum for UCL researchers to work on resource uh, and environmental issues. Uh, and I walked into a party uh, last Friday um, uh, where they'd all been talking to each other all day long and there were some 90 people assembled for that cross-disciplinary forum. It was uh, deeply uh, impressive, particularly as I learned that that has really come together in just the last few years, four or five years. So it's a remarkable achievement to pull that all together. But we also have uh, UCL uh, public policy, uh, which works under David Price's uh, guidance, and that provides routes for engagement between academics and uh, policy makers, uh, including through the recent UCL Green Economy Policy Commission, which Paul uh, himself uh, chaired. And then you'll all be aware, those of you from UCL, about our grand uh, challenge approach, and this brings expertise um, uh, together uh, to address the world's key problems, and that's obviously under the umbrellas of global health, 
sustainable cities, uh, intercultural interactions and human uh, well-being. And it's through those grand challenges that we champion our uh, cross-disciplinary uh, working and, and that's very much uh, of the kind that um, the Institute of Sustainable uh, Resources embodies. I would just make the simple observation that all of those grand challenges will be heavily influenced by a single factor called human uh, behaviour. Uh, so there is a grand uh, unifying theme. But uh, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Jonathan, who's going to uh, say a few words uh, of welcome uh, on behalf of the Minister. But Janish, we are deeply honoured that you've come here to speak tonight. I'm really looking forward to hearing your lecture. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael and uh, Paul. I'm Jonathan Tilson from DEFRA. Um, as you heard, last minute substitute, the Minister Dan Rogerson was very much looking forward to being here, but uh, unfortunately he's been prevented by the whips. So instead, he's asked me to deliver the address of introduction and welcome he would have um, done had he been able to be here. Um, first of all, um, delighted to be here. Well, I am. He would have been. Um, <laughs> and to have a chance to congratulate UCL on organising this event to discuss resource efficiency and the circular economy. Um, thanks to uh, Paul and Michael and indeed for the Krishna for coming to share his thoughts on this subject. Um, the Minister was very conscious that this has been a theme running through the Commissioner's tenure. and. He felt that the reason these issues are so high up the agenda um, owes much to the Commission's passion and conviction. Um, your leadership, personal and public vision for a more sustainable world have helped set the direction for concrete action for political and business leaders and civil society to take forward together. These are both subjects close to my heart, not just as a minister, but because of my own long and deeply held interest in the environment. It's a real pleasure to speak on things which are not only of importance to my work that are personally important to me. Making better use of our resources and reducing waste is something I'm passionate about. This has been part of my life as an MP from the start. Amongst other things, the Minister has sat on the EFRA Select Committee and co-chaired the Associate Parliamentary Sustainable Resources Group. And just as importantly, um, people have said I volunteered for these jobs. <laughs> With the long history in this area, I know that the way that we manage our resources is important. And as, as a person who wants to see a stronger economy and a fairer society, I know that how we get the best out of our resources is important for our future growth and environmental and human health. This event is timely for a number of reasons. We await the imminent publication, I think in fact on the, the 1st of July, of the Commission's communication on the circular economy. We look forward to seeing it and we'll be listening carefully to you, Commissioner, for clues as to what you expect, what to expect, forgive me. As you know, Commissioner, the Environmental Audit Committee um, here in the UK is currently examining growing the circular economy. We welcome this inquiry and indeed your recent input to it. Much of what the committee is considering will, I think, tie into your own vision for a more resource efficient Europe. I'm also conscious that this is rising up the global agenda as well in the context of the ongoing discussions on the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals and consideration of the actions that all countries can take in relation to sustainable consumption and production. And Sparrow DEFRA officials will be discussing these issues with some of their counterparts from a number of other member states in what I hope will be a real exchange of ideas and best practice. Those member states officials are here tonight. I'm pleased to welcome them to the UK. Why is resource efficiency so important? Why does this matter to all of us here tonight? Well, it matters not only because how we conserve our resources and reduce waste is good for our environment here and globally, and it makes sense in economic terms as well. The evidence proves that. A 2011 study for DEFRA estimated that through improving their use of energy, waste and water, UK businesses could save approximately £23 billion a year with around £10 billion attributable to small and medium-sized enterprises. Amongst other things, improving resource productivity in manufacturing can lead to £10 billion per annum in additional profits for UK manufacturers, 
314,000 new manufacturing jobs and 27 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent per annum, greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Last year, the Foresight Report on the Future of Manufacturing to 2050 was published, highlighting some of the future challenges and opportunities for UK businesses. Amongst the many findings, a shift to more sustainable manufacturing was highlighted, embracing new and alternative business models. The scarcity of materials, combined with growing costs and environmental impacts of energy consumption and waste disposal, will make the original manufacturer products less desirable. Manufacturing firms are likely to be pushed towards systems that entail a circular flow of products and allow a shift from a linear economy to a circular economy. This has to be seen as an opportunity and not as a threat. We know that there are multiple benefits that building a more circular economy can bring to individual businesses and to the wider UK economy. Better management of materials, water and energy and reducing waste by business makes a difference to the bottom line and improves competitiveness. It frees up finance for vital investment elsewhere in a company. UK businesses can then do more with their money, drive more growth and create more jobs. A saving of between 30 and 60 billion pounds could be achieved by adopting a circular approach to designing and using cars, vans, washing machines and mobile phones. Closing the loop, as it's termed, to manage waste effectively can also provide new ways of using precious materials. The case for action is clear. Everyone, government, industry, civil, so civil society and consumers has a stake in this and we all need to play our part. Many UK businesses are leading the way not just here but across Europe as well by reducing their environmental impact through greater resource efficiency, productivity and innovation. In this situation, the role of government is to provide the right policy frameworks and support so that businesses can drive the change to a sustainable economy. Ensuring business and industry have the tools and the freedom to enable them to realise the benefits, promoting growth and protecting the environment. For example, the government has set up the Green Investment Bank to lever in private sector funding, with priority sectors including waste infrastructure, offshore wind, the Green Deal and non-domestic energy efficiency. We continue to fund RAP to the tune of some £17 million a year, to deliver a wider range of resource efficiency activities, including by exploring new business models. RAP's expertise in this area is recognised across the EU and makes a major contribution to what we want to achieve in terms of moving towards a more circular economy. We are also working with business groups to better understand the barriers to improving resource efficiency for small and medium-sized companies, for example through our action-based research projects. For example, a DEFRA-funded project led by the Environment and Sustainability Partnership in partnership with Bangor University, Energy, the Engineering Employers Federation and Rolls-Royce is providing resource efficiency manager support to two clusters of manufacturing SMEs to help realise and deliver real benefits. We're also promoting the European Commission's Eco Innovation Action Plan where we aim to improve conditions and access to finance for research and innovation, ensuring ideas turn into products and services creating growth of jobs. The latest figures show that on eco-innovation performance, the UK is the fifth highest ranking member state in the EU. We're also taking part in the Commission's Environmental Technology Verification Programme to increase investor confidence in the environmental performance of cutting-edge technologies and assist SMEs to break through into the market. Indeed, tomorrow, the Minister will be hosting, I hope, will be hosting um, an event in DEFRA to help promote this pilot and raise awareness about the verification bodies. In conclusion, <coughs> boosting sustainable growth whilst continuing to protect and improve our environment remains a key strategic aim for this government. We will keep making changes, sorry, we will keep making the change to a smarter, more resource efficient, sustainable economy. We understand this is a key aim too for the incoming Italian Presidency and we welcome the fact that this issue will be the focus of next month's Informal Environment Council, which Dan Rogerson will be attending. We will continue to work with our European partners and the Commission to ensure that we achieve our overall aim of a more resource efficient Europe. Thank you again for this opportunity to give the UK Government perspective and it now gives me great pleasure to invite Commissioner Potocznik to give the <coughs>
First of all, uh, really sincerely, I would like to thank you for the possibility to be here, uh, Provost, for hosting me, and uh, in particular, Paul, because uh, I have learned a lot from Paul during uh, this last four or five years working in the European Commission and doing with that. For some of you, uh, if somebody has already followed my TED talk, which I have recently recorded, you will not hear a lot of new. But uh, they told me at the beginning on our course uh, that if you want to communicate with public, you have to repeat, 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 repeat. <laughs> so that's the lesson which I have learned, and part of that lesson you will hear today. So. Uh, uh, let me start. Uh, I was basically commissioner for five years from in the years of the deepest economic crisis in Europe. So you would probably imagine that this is not the simple job uh, because uh, I have hurt growth and jobs so many times that if you wake me in the middle of the night, I will repeat those two words. <laughs> But anyway, uh, we tried to do our best. So one thing which I got a bit of the feeling, and uh, it's a kind of a bitter feeling, whenever I have entered into the room, I, I felt a bit like, uh, like Shrek or Incredible Hulk. In both cases, a green monster. <laughs> because uh, when you are responsible for the environment, practically everybody considers that you will defend the environment regardless of anything else. So uh, we are pretty uh, responsible politicians also if we are taking care for the environment. And, uh, but that's, uh, by the way, one of the areas which I wanted to, I was insisting on. I basically refused for other portfolios when uh, Barroso was distributing the portfolios. So today I'm basically here to, to talk to you as a concerned citizen, as a father of two kids, for which I would like to, them to have the future and somebody who happens to be also environment commissioner. But let us go, oh sorry, that one would be the right one. Let us go to, uh, uh, to the lecture itself. There is only one message which I, I would like that all of you would take with you when we finish. That's the change is unavoidable. And I will try to persuade you why this is the case. There are basically two reasons. One reason which are very vocal and everybody can easily understand them, but in politics it's part of the arguments which are not easily heard. It's the environmental arguments. <coughs> the second part are arguments which are then connected to economy and are connected to competitiveness. I will share with you both. Let me start with the environmental ones. I read this in uh, Nature in July 2012. It was signed by many scientists. Basically, what he's saying is that human population growth and per capita consumption rate underlie all the other present drivers for global change. Let me try to explain you what it's in that sentence. You all know that we are 7 billion currently on the planet and that we will be in 2045 approximately 9 billion. We have heard those figures so many times that we simply take them for granted, and we don't really think what does that mean. And I will try to translate those figures to you. It means that in one generation, we will have on the planet additionally more people than it was the total amount of population at the beginning of 20th century. At the beginning of 20th century, it was 1.5 billion. In one generation, in 30 years, we will have additionally 2 billion. That means in 300 days, less than 300 days, in 10 months, United Kingdom. It means in nine days, in six, hour, in six hours, my country. So if you go to my country, which is obviously a bit small, you need to count in hours. But that's where we are. And that's a trend which is, which is clearly happening, not in Europe, not in the developed part of the world, but which then complicates the thing even more because per capita consumption uh, <coughs> is growing at the same time and assumptions which were done by McKinsey are that till 2030 we will have additionally 3 billion consumers which will move from, uh, middle, uh, from uh, poverty to the middle class consumption. <coughs> so everything would be nice if we would not deal with the planet 
where the resources are limited, fresh water, oceans, land, soil, clean water, clean air, sorry, raw materials, biodiversity, ecosystems, fuel, where by 2050 we will need three times more resources than we are currently using. We will need 70% more of feed, food and fiber than we are currently using. If the trends would continue like are now, then in 2030 we will be approximately 40% short of drinking water. And all that in the context that today the 60% of the ecosystems which are underpinning those resources are basically degraded or are used unsustainably. So coming to the conclusion from that, that we need to change, it's more than obvious and simple. And you need to be pretty smart to come to that conclusion, even if in many cases, as I told you, this is not the story which many would like to hear. That's why it's important also to have another part of the arguments which are also pretty clear and vocal. There are four major reasons why in Europe we need to change. First is that we are locked in industrial society which is based on resource intensive growth model. It started here with industrial revolution and it's still prevailing model. We are using 15 tons of materials per person yearly, five tons of that becomes waste, half of that is landfill and lost forever. We are locked in into economic model, we are locked in in financial models, we are locked in in infrastructure, we are locked in in business behavior, in cons uh, consumer behavior, we are simply locked in. The second reason is if you look to the resource prices, resource prices were falling <coughs> during the 20th century with the exemption of two peaks, uh, two world wars and the oil crisis. But the trend was falling. In the meantime, the labor prices were growing. And that's why all the companies were more or less focusing on labor productivity. And resource productivity was not something which was very much in focus. The things changed from the beginning of the century. From 1998 till 2012, we call it a hockey stick. 300% average increase of resource prices. 85% of European companies are saying they're expecting the increase of resource prices in the next five years. The third argument is that even today, if you look to the German industry, which is the biggest and quite developed European industry, the facts are that you can connect from the cost structure 18% to the labor costs and 43% to the resource costs. So even today, this is the prevailing cost factor. And yet, we economists still talk only about labor productivity. You will rarely hear anybody talking about total factor productivity, resource productivity, and other issues. And the fourth argument is that Europe is extremely import dependent. We are importing more than 60% of energy today. If you would took the periodic system, I can lead you through and show you how much of all resources, practically all resources which are inbuilt in high-tech products are imported. Which means if you combine those uh, messages, which, uh, those four messages, the conclusion is very simple. We will be, if we want, seriously to keep industry in Europe, then it is utmost important that we start producing the same products using less energy, less water, less raw materials, products which can be reused, recycled, and that's basically where we should move. Otherwise, we are simply ignoring globalization and the changed world and the... the, the, the uh, um, risks which are in this globalized world existing. So the conclusion is again pretty much the same if you go through the economic logic. We need to change the way we produce, we need to change the way we consume, we need to change the way how we live. That's conclusion to which you come through that kind of. Not a lot of people today are talking about that, but it is a prevailing and core question if we want sincerely to keep industry in Europe not protecting the unprotectable. Because unprotectable is simply unprotectable. But creating new, seeing that as a major business opportunity for the future. 
So if you want, now these were these were basically arguments which I would like on the, uh, which on which I would like to uh, underline with some empirical uh, 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 evidence why we need to change. These are the clusters of the countries. Uh, here you have human development index, which means that this is the quality of life on the horizontal X, and on the vertical you have ecological footprint, global hectares per person, which means are you in line with <coughs> sustainability. So all the countries in the development are moving like that, here, and then down. You don't see any country moving here, and by the way, this green territory here, it's good life within environmental limits. How many countries are within? Zero. So the real problem which we have today, Europe is predominantly here, UK is somewhere here. Uh, these are clusters, as I said, it's not country per country. But UK has five hectares and 0 0.9 human <coughs> development index, so it's somewhere here. And if you look to that story, what is our challenge now? Our challenge is that the bulk of the countries which are here would not repeat our path, but if they, the, the only way that they don't repeat our path is that we change our path. And we are the technology drivers, and we need to show that that is possible. If we will not show that that is possible, then we will hit the wall. So that's basically what what is the global situation at this very moment. So, uh, that's coming too soon. Uh, why I'm optimistic? There is a number of challenges which are ahead of us, uh, and they are, a lot of them are connected with inefficiencies in the world in which we live. Turning coal into light, it's 3% efficient. Only 15% of energy we put in our petrol tank, it's used to move the car down the road. 80% of what we produce, it's used once and then discarded. Only 1% of valuable rare earth that we use in products are recycled at the end of the product life. And the final and the ultimate inefficiency is 80% of resources are used by 20% of earth population, which is of course also connected then with the poverty story. So, if you take just one example, I'm pretty sure that you have all the mobile phone in your pocket. You can produce a wedding ring by recycling 10 kilos of mobile phones or by digging from the earth 10 tons, tons of, golden, of gold ore. That's what we are doing, by the way. And that's what we should do. But uh, the fact is that we are recycling currently less than 10% of mobile phones. Just think about yourself how much of them are in your drawers and how much you are using. Which means more than 100 million each year in the drawers. And if you would just recycle those in Europe, you would get 2.4 tons of gold, 25 tons of silver, one ton of palladium and 900 tons of copper. Just mobile phones. And I can develop that kind, that kind of story on practically any product you wish. Here we are. Here it's our society. So, the role of the markets. Of course, markets... I, I'm a believer in the markets. Because even if you are not a believer, we don't have better thing to offer, and it will stay with us. But the fact is that markets cannot ensure efficiency in the allocation and use of resources if prices do not reflect the true value and costs of resources, and they do not, if rewards to capital are disproportionate to other inputs, and they are, if managers on annual contracts are used to make short-term investment decisions over the influence by bonuses based on short-term share prices, which is the fact. So there are there is enormously a lot of market failures which are currently existing. And it would be
So if we look to the to the next uh, slide and uh, when when we talk about I've heard many times you know, quite a lot of times also from your country that we are overregulated and uh, that we should uh, be careful about those things there is one thing regulation is not bad but bad regulation is bad and we should be careful when we simply attack regulation itself. I will give you one example. I think it's the best for this moment because the, the football cup is going on. Football is as much global game as its market economy, which is also global. So ask the best players on the football field, do they want to have a good referee and clear rules of the game? This is, by the way, regulation. So you would get straightforward answer that they would like to have good referee and good clear rules of the game. Because if we would not have them, the alternative is chaos on the field and the most aggressive players prevailing. And that's many times happening today on the global market. And that's why you need clear rules, predictable rules, which are leading us somewhere. Because we need to know where we go. If we don't know where we go, then obviously we will have a problem and hit the wall. I'm a believer also in innovation and in incentives. We have adopted the Eco Innovation Action Plan. But for innovation, again, to be really efficient, you need to give a clear policy signals in which direction you would like that innovation goes. I'm a believer in product design. You have probably heard about uh, eco-design many times also from a critical side of you, but what is the essence of the eco-design? You, the destiny of the product is decided at the moment when it's designed. So if it's designed in a way that it can't be recycled, if you can't remove the battery from your mobile phone, then you have a problem. That's why the eco-design is so critically important. Then consumer's behavior. We have eco-labeling instrument in our hands. But currently, we have approximately 400 eco-labels globally. 48% of consumers, one out of two, are saying that they don't trust anymore to the eco-label. So something is terribly wrong there, but it's enormous power in the hands of the consumers. And finally, of course, also business model, it's important part. So it's not important that you owe something. It's important that you use it. That's why sharing... Uh, sharing, uh, leasing, and other models will in future be more important than they are today. So yes, eco-industries are important, but the real question is how we change these nice, clear examples which we have in some companies to the prevailing trend. Not eco-design, uh, sorry, not eco-industries are the, the answer of the game. The answer is changing traditional industries in a way that they will respect the very uh, problem which uh, we have to address. So those two words, resource efficiency and circular economy, are so important. It's, it's interesting that uh, this is explained to you by an environmental commissioner, because in essence it would need to be explained by somebody else. But uh, we have worked on resource efficiency in the first half of the mandate and we are working now on the circular economy in the second half. Uh, why it's important to combine those, those both two? Because you can still be, in the linear economy, you can still be resource efficient, uh, but uh, you can still lose a lot of things. So I think it's very important that you go from one step to another. This is basically, in essence, the summary of the proposal which we will deliver, uh, not uh, uh, like you mentioned on the 18th of, uh, never mention the dates if you are in the commission. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, since we are very close to that date, I, I will dare to mention that we will deliver it on the 1st of July. So uh, what, is in the, what is in the package? The most important part of the package is uh, review of the legally binding targets. We have three directives, uh, Waste Framework Directive, Waste Packaging and Packaging Directive, and uh, Landfill Directive. And all legal requirements there will be reviewed. 
Then we have uh, we have four communications which are coming. One on buildings, one on food. These are two things where we will try to holistically look into the matters. <coughs> then green entrepreneurship action plan. So in particular looking to the SMEs question and green employment communication. So I'm working with five colleagues. So it's really a kind of comprehensive story and package. And you can see that uh, Europe, which uh, was already mentioned by, by Paul, uh, has provided practically the very essence of the direction where we would like to go. And one important issue is connected to the resource efficiency target. Maybe if I go to the next slide, uh, because it's in, in which you can see. So we have a chapeau communication, then we have a review of always targets in line. This, will be, this, uh, this is legal. Uh, review and these are political documents, majority communications, and finally, what we would like to introduce, and the major debate will be here basically, is we would like to introduce the headline target resource productivity. Currently, we have labor productivity where we are following that closely, but we don't have resource productivity. So, the gap in the cost structure is obviously existing there, and that's what we would like to introduce. We are proposing raw material consumption on GDP. I know it's not the best, but when you start with the, uh, with the targets, headline targets in particular, they need to be simple, they need to be understandable, and statistics should be able to produce them. Currently, we don't have the statistics for all member states. We have for five, six, but we have an agreement with Eurostat, Estat, that they are able to produce them quickly. That's why probably at the beginning we would need to use uh, as a proxy domestic material consumption in GDP. Uh, that's worse because you don't have imported material inside and uh, that's not the, the story which we would like to follow. This would be a political target, it would not be binding and it would not be sector by sector because it's impossible because otherwise you destroy immediately construction or some other sectors because it's uh, not. But what is the essence of such kind of thing? The essence is that you have obligation to the member states that they took those things seriously and that they prepare their policy actions in those fields. That's the essence. It's like we have 3% of investment in, in R&D in GDP, one of the targets, five targets in the EU 2020, and it's not binding and it's not per member state, but it's constantly moving the countries in one direction. Our recommendation was that at least we would need to increase the resource productivity for minimum 30% till 2030, which would be basically speeding up the trend, doubling the trend which uh, we would see in normal circumstances. Let me slowly conclude. Uh, We are living in the 21st century and uh, I think that we can jointly agree that it's a century which is very much different than it was the previous one and, uh, and the others. We are more interconnected and more interdependent than ever. In a fragment of a second, you can reach anybody. So the consequence, and when we talk about the issues which I was talking about, we don't talk about the survival of the planet. No, we talk about the survival of the human race on the planet. And uh, when uh, the, the fact is that with the number of the population, with the growth of consumption, for the first time we are very, very seriously influencing on the balance of the planet. So responsibility today of an individual person, of anybody of us and collectively, it's uncomparable to the responsibility which we hold one century ago uncomparable. And we simply need to start behaving differently. Environmental policy making will need to change because in the past, I will be simplifying a bit, but the story is not far from truth. In the past, we were making environmental policy in a way that each of the sectors was following its own interests and profits. And when the same people, the same CEOs, came from home, came from their companies in the evening home, take off the jackets, 
they finally recognize that the air which they are breathing is not clean enough, and the water which they are drinking is not clean enough. And that was the moment where a public interest wake up, of course. And that's the reason why all of us, through the public pressure, basically induce the legislation which was pretty strict in air, water, and else. What is the problem with that? It's not that we would not have a good legislation. The problem is that a lot of investments in good faith what done, was in the past done in the wrong things. And that brings the conflict. <coughs> conflict between economic development and environmental preservation. And I have heard that a thousand times, that we are the ones who are stopping economic development, which is not true. And I think it's the only way, if you want to reconcile those things, it's that you integrate environment early enough into the policy making. It's like uh, illness if you prevent or cure the illness. If you prevent the illness, that's integration. If you cure the illness, it's more costly and you are ill. And that's basically the situation which we are facing uh, in our environmental preservation currently. So, I've also heard thousands of times that, yeah, fine, what you are saying uh, sounds very good, but now it's times of crisis and we should focus on the short term, short term and leave the long term <coughs> questions aside. If we do not answer those questions which are here and now, and it's ideal situation where we, you have to review the economic policy because of the crisis, it's ideal situation when you can change. So don't listen to anybody who will be selling you the story that these are longer term issues. This is short term here and now. But there is one fact of short and long term which is true. That is that our societies are organized in a way that we don't think long term. Maybe we think, but we don't act like that. Tell me one politician who was re-elected because he or she was thinking long term. Tell me one CAO who is rewarded on the long term results. No. And that is a real problem. It's, the problem is that 21st century, with all the challenges which we are facing, it's simply not allowing us that kind of decision making. It's, it's dead end street. It will, we will hit the world. And it's absolutely important that we reconcile those things. So environmental protection, it's not an obstacle to economic growth. It's just the opposite. The real obstacle to economic growth in the future, to economic development in the future, it's ignoring the environment effects. That's the real end of economic growth, because we will hit the world. We should learn from nature, in, <coughs> in particular when we talk about circular economy, because nature is the biggest, the best organized circular system. Millions of years of adaptation, where nothing is lost and everything has a purpose. And people are saying that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years in the past. Actually, we have missed that point. But the second best is now. Because you would certainly not like to have somebody like me in 20 years standing here and telling you the same story. Basically, it will not be the same story. It will be much more dramatical than the story which I have shared with you today. So, that's the last slide. Basically, environment and economy are two sides of the same coin. And we should finally stop flipping that coin. Because it will do harm to the economy and it will do harm to the environment. If I have learned anything in five years of my mandate was the simple truth that if you want seriously to protect the environment, you have to go to the basics of the economic theory and economic behavior. Not going there, we will constantly fight only with the consequences. And the second, if you seriously want to talk about economic development, economic growth, new jobs, you cannot talk about that taking into account that we live on the planet with the boundaries. And those two things are the things which are the change I would like to remember from today's lecture. Thank you.
thank you, Ganesh. Um, a terrific speech. And I'm not going to say anything at all uh, except to uh, invite you now to ask some questions, make some comments. Um, if they're comments, please make them brief and let them come to a question. Um, please introduce yourself, uh, say your name and any affiliation that you may have so that we can kind of place where you're coming from uh, and then we'll um, uh, interrogate either uh, Jonathan on uh, the UK issues related to these questions or indeed you know, for any of the things that he was saying today. I'd like to keep the subject, please, on the topic of the evening. There's any number of things you might like to ask Ganesh, but we're going to stick on the topic of the evening. So thank you very much. Who can, uh, who'd like to start off? Gentleman down the front. Hi, I'm Dominic Hawk from uh, Unomia Research and Consulting. Um, <coughs> thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I just wondered, as you, as you do look forward to the long term, you talked about market failures and price signals. Is there a, are there policy instruments perhaps that are not in the uh, package that's coming forward that you would say, <coughs> if we were to start working now, what are the policy instruments yeah. that you would say were most desirable in order to foster the transition that we're looking yeah. to, to make? I think it's, uh, first of all, of course, the, the package which I was presenting is, is uh, I would say, <coughs> Smart, small part of the picture. The real essence is that uh, what I was trying to do the whole five years was when any of my colleagues was proposing any of their proposal, we really went deeply into the proposal and tried to put in, to the, in, in the logic. We have, as you, as you probably know, the new governance, economic governance system in Europe. We call it, it has a nickname, Semester. It's uh, each year we go through and uh, we analyze member states and at the end we give recommendations to member states what they would need to do. I think that uh, that that semester would need to be used to the utmost extent. Currently, it's uh, Commissioner for <coughs> Economy, Taxes and Commissioner for uh, Social Development who are proposing together. I think that there would need to be also the one who is responsible for environment. If we are serious about the triangle of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental, I think it should be all three. But what we have tried to do, and we have basically reorganized the whole directorate inside uh, our commission those five years, we have tried to develop a knowledge in various areas. For example, um, environmental taxes, tax incentives. Tax incentives are in the hands of member states, but they can use that instrument much better than they are using it. It, is, it makes no sense that we are taxing a lot labor, what is the case today, where the labor is uh, scarce, uh, it's a resource which is not scarce, we have unemployment which is high, but on the other hand, we have a scarce resources which we are not taxing a lot. And uh, so moving part of the taxation from, uh, from uh, uh, labor to the to the pollution or to the resources would be one of the areas of economic instruments one should use. The second, which is uh, very important, are environmental harmful subsidies. They are a major category still, and everybody agrees about that, and it's in all political documents written that we will get rid of it, but when it comes to the moment that we need to get rid of them, we don't. And that's uh, somehow the frustration which I'm seeing constantly. And if you can't get rid of environmentally harmful subsidies in times when you have the major budgetary problems and it's basically two-side win, then I don't know when you will get rid of them. Uh, the third is typically would be public procurement. Uh, public procurement is 16-17% of GDP. We are currently using public procurement predominantly uh, for the purposes of uh, lowering the price through the competition. But we don't use that as an instrument through which we would like to change, in essence, the behavior, the substance. And I think that that should be better exploited than it is. It is an ideal tool, 
if you have a lot of public investment, a lot of public money which goes into, into investment, that you use it, that you redirect. But for that, you need to know that you want to redirect your policy. That's, in essence, what you have to do. Then, of course, there are other things which are connected with waste management, water management, eco-innovation, and so on, which are all part of that economic governance story, where you can, through semester, push member states still that we would shift the, the direction. These are classical economic instruments and tools through which you can influence on prices, through which you can influence on, on, um, on uh, setting the right course of the economy. One, one fundamental thing is, of course, uh, recognizing uh, the value of something. Today, the companies are recognizing the value of uh, of energy because they pay it. They are recognizing the value of raw materials because they pay it. They are recognizing the value of water so-so because we don't charge it properly and in many cases don't charge it at all. They, but the rest, uh, natural capital, uh, eco eco ecosystems and so on, that's, that's practically for free. So you can still, you don't have it. So, Natural capital accounting, corporate sustainability reporting, those are the core elements if you want to shift the, the, the economy into the right direction. And for that you need good statistical system, you need to change, you need beyond GDP story, which is uh, the fact that uh, all of us know that GDP is not the only measurement of how uh, happy we are and uh, uh, how good we live in our countries, but it's an important measurement. It will not disappear, but it would need to be accompanied also with uh, other things, and uh, that's that's basically, in short, a long story of the transformation which one would need to do. So it's really whatever you touch, you have to change something, but it's important to know that whatever you touch, you have to understand that you go there, and you have to touch it that you go there. Thank you. Ah, a few more hands coming up. There's a lady, two ladies at the back there, so let's take them at their next. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Liana Raja from the University of Cambridge. And um, yes, I was really inspired by this excellent point you made about labor efficiency versus re uh, resource efficiency and how <coughs> the taxation is only about the income of the labor and maybe some of this could be shifted to resource taxation. How do you think, do you see, what do you think would be the best way for this shift to happen across Europe for each member state or could that be done at the European level? You are, you are asking to, to change a treaty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it will be quick. Uh, currently, the system is such that member states are responsible for the taxation. And what the Commission can do is uh, do the recommendation or try to do some of the things. We are not so innocent when it comes to taxes, like we look at the first side. But uh, the bulk of the decision sits in the Member States' hands. So what we are trying to do is, through the semester, giving recommendation to Member States. And we gave some 12 Member States last year, if I remember well, that they should shift the taxation. But, uh, of course, then you have to follow up and... Uh, so it's, uh, it's difficult when you have the distribution of power which is absolutely clear, which means nobody can force a member state to change the system which is in their hands, then the wisdom in the member states should be high enough to change the tax system. Thanks very much. I'll just to come back on that for the UK. I chaired a process called the Green Fiscal Commission up until 2009. And if you Google that, you will find our recommendations to the UK government, which so far they have not taken up. Thank you. There's a lady here that uh, might like to talk. I wrote my thesis on the You may need to speak a bit more loudly. <coughs> we... Right 
Yeah, I think absolutely everything starts with education, where we are lacking, where we have a major hole. We don't educate the things, uh, or we started really late uh, from uh, elementary school going on, that uh, even today I know my, my kids just finished uh, economy in Ljubljana and they don't teach them that this is a problem at all. And when he was following, uh, so he's now frustrated with, uh, <laughs> with his school, and he said that he will finish masters only to please his mother and father. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just want to say that education is a, a major missing hole. Of course, uh, uh, in dissemination of those things uh, are important, and I personally believe that there is a lot of. Uh, uh, that there is a lot of will and a lot of understanding and a major power in, in us consumers, especially because a lot are concerned with our health and with our environment. And sometimes I also have the feeling that our heads of states are a bit disconnected from the real problems which we are in daily lives uh, discussing with. Of course, it's very much growth and jobs and uh, every. Uh, every one of us would like to have a job, but when you look to, uh, to public opinion, then you would certainly find out that some of the things which are connected with environmental preservation, with the health, when it comes to the illness, we are ready to pay whatever is uh, necessary. But do you know that we have, due to the air pollution, 400,000 premature deaths in Europe, 10 times more than we have in car accidents, and we bluntly more or less ignore those things. And uh, we will simply need to raise the voice. And uh, for the young generation, uh, you are the masters of the uh, social media. Press on us. Give us such a push that we will not be able to ignore those things anymore. All of us politicians, all of the people who are working in the business sector. But business sector, I'm, I'm frankly not even afraid of it. I'm afraid that the messages which are coming to <coughs> political elite are not coming from a progressive part of the business because always the most vocal are the ones who want to protect the, the things which they need to protect because they are non-protectable by market itself and by developments itself. And that's why in too many cases you would see that, uh, that, um, uh, that associations which are protecting or which are protecting the interests of of, of various sectors are, are very much following low, lowest common denominator and that's not good I think it's not good so for me part of the answer it's also inside the business sector that they would simply the, the ones who know that they are on the right path and they are doing the right thing and it's many of them that they would become simply more vocal so that the message of, of the business of industry would become more uh, a balanced message, uh, which we would absolutely need, I think. All the political establishment would need that kind of message. Thank you, Janish. Just a, a, a quickie back, uh, back to you, that um, many of you here will have heard in the context of the circular economy, uh, the work of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Yeah. They're organizing this autumn a disruptive innovation mm -hmm. festival, at which a number of students who, like uh, Janish's son, uh, dissatisfied with the economics education that they're getting uh, are going to be calling for uh, a rethinking of economics and particularly greater emphasis being given to these sorts of topics. So you may like to click in on Ellen MacArthur Foundation Disruptive Innovation Festival this autumn. Forest of Hands, let's go over here. Yes, there was, uh, we'll take this little cluster of three just here. And uh, we'll take them all at once, shall we, Janesh, yeah, and then yeah. you can uh, you can do it. So the lady at the back first, and then the two gentlemen just sitting in front. Thank you. So um, my name is Kirsten McIntyre, and I'm from Hewlett Packard. Um, so speaking as a producer, I'd like to slightly address the previous comment. It is within it is in our own interest to produce products that people want to buy, and we understand that very well in the IT sector, and that's why our products are now enormously more energy efficient than they used to be, because people are very clear on their energy bills. And uh, whether you're a, a commercial customer or a home consumer, we've been working on these things. So I do think that you don't always need too strong a lever 
because manufacturers want to make products that people want to buy, because that's good for us as well. So I have a question slightly around that topic, which is really, <coughs> do you see any, conflict is quite a strong word in here, but do you see any, any uh, conflict between the requirement to reduce uh, carbon emissions and the requirement to increase potentially recycling, recycled content in products? When I think about collecting all of that 100 million mobile phones, it's going to take quite a lot of energy to do that. And is it, is it worth it, is the question, uh, when you're also trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Okay, I'm going to give Ganesh a chance to think about that. He's writing furiously. A gentleman just in front. Uh, Nick, Nicholas Watts, linked to the Free University Berlin. Um, but you mentioned consumer behavior. And I was wondering how you think it might be possible to shift or at least increase the balance of effort and research into behavior change, lifestyle change. And I know there's a lot of excellent work in this country and others, but it does seem to be under-emphasized in the overall budgeting. And the gentleman to his right. Takashi uh, Matsuda, Kyoto University. I'm very impressed about the last part of your slide, which is saying about the issue about the time scale and the, uh, the uh, kind of the geographical scale. So the, I, I think the economy and the environment is a much different. Economy is very short-sighted and very small scale or, or a now globally, global uh, uh, industry is happening. So how would you uh, expand your kind of brilliant idea into the generation, the long term, and the uh, very, very wide space, wide uh, global areas, uh, extend the uh, region of countries? So three pretty simple questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you've had some time to think about them. So um, away you go. Since I was listening to the second and third, I didn't have the time to think. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we start with uh, the first one. Yeah, there are uh, always uh, trade-offs uh, trade between solutions. And you have to think about that. That's why all the methodologies which we are developing, and we are doing a lot on pilot currently. Uh, we, we started with an interesting activity which is called uh, uh, internal market green products and organizations, where we are for the product groups and organizations trying to develop a kind of uh, uh, methodology which is based on life cycle assessment, through which you could then find uh, what is in essence, the best way uh, to do it, and we have we are currently practicing that uh, on pilot level with many uh, companies, which have volunteered to that, and it's quite promising activity. So we are not yet there, but uh, uh, absolutely I agree with you that you cannot, as such, say something is good, something is bad. But uh, I could start polemically immediately by saying, of course, also if you are digging golden ore, if you are using cyanide, and so on you know exactly where we would uh, then arrive. And the problem, you know, the problem, if you do not recycle, what is the problem? What is, in essence, the problem of the linear and circular economy? What is the difference? With linear economy, you go like that. You dig, you produce, you consume, you throw away. You dig deeper, you produce, you consume, you throw away. You dig even deeper, which is becoming more costly, more rare, you don't get it anymore, you go to more unprotected areas or protected areas, and that's the problem of the whole story. With the growing population, with everything, it's not ending well. So the result, the result is, economic result is growing resource prices, which is basically happening for many of those resources. But for humanity, the result is that we have to reconsider seriously how we will use some of those things, because they are limited. That's why we think that it's good to think in circular logic. But it, I absolutely agree with you that you need to go case by case and see uh, what is, in some cases, you know, we have typical uh, uh, trade-offs, uh, for example, in protection of biodiversity, then pr producing the wind energy and so on, and, or, or even water energy. And you have to, for, from each case, you have to go really deeply and analyze what is pluses, what is minuses, and in which direction to go. 
Second would be, yeah, researching behavioral change and lifestyle change. I could be, I could be short here. I agree that we would need to finance it more. So the problem is that uh, we simply don't see that still as a, as an issue which is uh, uh, so important that we would need to put enough, even if I know that a lot is going on because I was before Commissioner for Science and Research, and I know that we have uh, in, invested quite a lot also in that. But uh, you get results proportionally with investments which you do. That's uh, unbearable truth. If we would invest in energy research uh, 50 years ago, we would today have the answers, but we, we didn't. I, I very well remember that investments in research for new energy in 2005 were one-fifth of investments in 1970s in Europe, R&D investments. Yeah, why? Because there was obviously an interest uh, clearly uh, that uh, fossil fuel society is a stable story, it's not causing us any problems, and we were not really going into the direction of searching new solutions. Now we are going. And uh, in particular when the countries like Germany or, or Japan, who are high-tech, decide that they would go no nuclear, you can expect that we will move very fast. And we are moving in some cases very fast, with some mistakes also, but moving uh, very fast. And uh, that's the same it's here. So the things which you believe that they are important for the change of the future direction in those, you have to invest. How expand the idea? Um, that was the gentleman's uh, question. I think it's uh, a lot is going on, especially from Rio Plus 20, when we started uh, those discussions globally very much, where finally the green economy was recognized by all, mem by all member states, I mean it, UN member states, uh, then we started to move in one solid direction. But the fact is that uh, many fast developing countries still consider any any mentioning of sustainability or, or those issues as uh, developed part of the world trying to hamper uh, the potential of the fast developing countries which have to address, which have to move from on that uh, uh, horizontal X uh, into direction right, so uh, that, that the quality of life is improving. So uh, that's why I, I, I was absolutely clear. So, Without us, who are technologically advanced, who know the answers, who can provide the answers, moving down, they will not move down. They will not move in this direction. They will move up and down like we did. And that will be disastrous. So uh, uh, ideal opportunities are discussions which we currently have in New York, post-sustainable uh, development goals. We are currently discussing, I'm, I'm also in charge together is with Commissioner Pibax for that story. So if you wish, we can go in detail. But I can tell you that what is currently happening is that we try to expand the Millennium Development Goals story, which worked pretty well on the least developed part of the world, on the Sustainable Development Goals, where this would be applicable not only in least developed part of the world, but globally to all. And that's where we are currently very much trying to push. And uh, uh, we have from the Commission side proposed the communication with 17 areas, uh, Currently, the things from the sustainability point of view look pretty good because uh, the targets which we try to introduce there are pretty strongly present, but uh, the whole discussion in New York is still ahead of us. So at the end of 2015, uh, the things will go parallelly. On one hand, we will have climate change negotiations. On the other hand, there will be discussion about sustainable development goals, and they will come together. Uh, these two conferences, they will not come together, but they will finish at the end of the same year and hopefully we will move somewhere. The message which I try to share that, 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 that it would be understood, we, in the Millennium Development Goals, there was a clear goal which was written that we need to provide clear drinking water and sanitation water for all. That was black and white. But if you do not protect water first, so sustainability of water first, then you can write it 10,000 times if you wish, but you are not able to provide it. So it is sustainability, it's part of poverty eradication. So if you do not 
join those two things and if you do not combine the policy activities you will simply not be able to with all goodwill to uh, to address the poverty eradication Okay, I, with, I, I, each, I, with each answer, it's more more. Hands. Yeah, it's absolutely. <laughs> I, I knew it would be like that, and, and clearly, I'm looking at the clock, and we're going to have to stop. So I'm just going to take three more, more or less, at random, and I've not been very good at seeing whose hand went up first. So I'm going to go right to the back there, number one. I'm going to come right down here, number two, and then and I'll take the lady there, then the back, number three. Okay. So, <coughs> uh, Emma Benton from the Institution of Environmental Sciences. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a theoretical question. What happens if your proposed package of measures doesn't, isn't enough to sway political will? So, you used the air flows and other material of your analogy. The recent Red Hat report quite clearly demonstrated that the current EU values aren't stringent enough, and yet the Commission was unwilling to reopen negotiations on the air flows directive. The world isn't there. So, you have your circular economy package, which has presumably very strong evidence for a case for strengthening and changing our economy. What happens if the reaction is the same? The political just isn't there to accept your measures. Okay, let's freeze that one there, and we'll come down to this corner here. Graham Stevens, uh, independent expert uh, team, blue green. We have, uh, as a member state, um, a judgment against us on a water directive. And as you just said, uh, we're about to get a one on air pollution as well. Uh, do you think the whole legal process for giving the um, new concepts and innovations and compliance with, with these directives uh, is most efficiently done in the courts? Or do you think your idea of um, having the uh, economic governance semesters uh, is a more effective way of, of, under, of uh, explaining to ministers what the uh, implications of the new innovation in technologies are. Right, interesting question, thank you. Um, the lady at the back, yours is the last one. Uh, Eunice Scrubs, the Chief Executive of the Renewable Energy Association. Thank you very much for your presentation. I want to give you a little bit of devil's advocate here. What evidence have we seen that such a package like this work when we had an instrument, a market instrument like the EU ETS, where that is supposedly supposed to change and shift behaviours, industry and energy, and yet it's probably one of the most ineffectual outturning market instruments. It's not doing its job, we're burning more coal now than we've ever in Europe. So I'd be interested in your Right, three very different questions. And then I'm going to ask Jonathan for some, you know, you can pick up anything you like. As, as, uh, <laughs> in fact, I'm going, to, I'm, going to ask you, I'm going to ask you after the second one so that we give uh, the Commissioner the last word, okay? Uh, so, so uh, just to give you a warning, pick up any of the questions that you feel you'd like. Perhaps the ones about UK infringement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> The, the first question is uh, pretty. <laughs> what happens if political will is not there? Problem. <laughs> Serious problem. But uh, I'm. I'm uh, no, first, for a politician on my position, the first reaction is frustration. And then, of course, it's the problem for all of us. I've been present on the discussion last week uh, when we discussed the new package for air quality, which you also mentioned. I was present in Environmental Council. The, the minimum, what I can say after that, is frustration. Because when, when we discuss seventh environmental action program, everybody is calling commission to be bold, ambitious. You should write that mo much more boldly than you did. And then we come to the uh, air package. We still agree that air quality and health is uh, absolutely something which we should address. But then when we propose concrete things, what you have to do, and we have proposed it with clear cost benefit structure in our head. So the proposals are the least costly and the one who provides most benefit. Each and any country practically is saying, no, 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 that's not for me, that's too difficult. Not farmers, not those, uh, don't touch that. And there is one thing which they simply don't understand. <coughs> those 
costs about air quality are here and now. Here. Only not paid by the polluters. But they are paid either by people who get ill, either paid by uh, health security system, which is covering, I don't know, uh, through the budget. <coughs> either they are paid by, uh, by a CAO whose workers are not coming at work because they are ill. Either they are paid by a farmer who is losing the crops. They are paid. So just redistribution of those costs <coughs> is different than we are proposing. What we are proposing is let's cut those things and first, and the, if somebody is not satisfied with the cost, of course, there will be much less people ill. There will be much less eutrophication. There will be much of less things lost. So that's the whole point. And many times, I, I'm simply frustrated with uh, too much short-term logic which is coming into a place and where we are really, uh, where we are really committed when we talk about, uh, uh, when we talk about problems in principle, but when, when, when it comes to concrete things, suddenly this enthusiasm, it's not existing anymore. And by the way, I was uh, telling in the very same terms uh, addressing the ministers, so that you won't think that I don't dare to tell, because it's, it's, it's obviously inconsistent. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense anymore that we do that, such kind of policy making. Obviously, there is not enough recognition that the problem exists, or there is clearly a uh, lobbying uh, voice coming bottom up, which is stronger from the sectors which would need to expose themselves more than other sectors. But if I would continue with the, with the example of farmers, uh, we have practically, practically each sector was very much uh, addressed via various type of legislation, how to, cut air, how to cut air emissions. And in the farming sector, we haven't done really something serious. So uh, methane there, uh, it's an absolute must that we have to address it because it has huge consequences, not only on air quality, uh, not only on ozone as, 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 as a precursor, but also on the, on the questions of, uh, of the climate change because it's much, much stronger climate uh, gas than, than CO2. So it's basically hitting two targets with one bullet, and I think it's uh, more than logical. And so, but, but there is no answer to your question. If there is obviously not enough will, it's not enough will when the problem will be such that you, as uh, citizens, will not tolerate that, there will be enough will. Second, uh, a legal process, uh, that's, that's a really good question. So to, to, to tell you, the thing which we hate in the Commission most is infringement. So we don't like those things. If somebody thinks that we enjoy sending any country to, to the court or anywhere, we hate it because it's conflict. But on the other hand, we have a clear questions which are coming from civil society and very rightly so. What are we doing that five, six years their country hasn't obliged with something they have committed to and they are not? And we are doing nothing. And according to the treaty, we have to do it. So we don't have the possibility not to send somebody to court or send him. There is a bit of flexibility which you have in your hands. But when the things are simply too long on the table, there is no way. So we have a kind of saying, strictly helpful and helpfully strict. <laughs> and we try to apply it whatever means that in practice. Uh, but I, I agree with you that the tools which are soft tools, semester and so on, are really powerful tools and we should use them. We haven't done that enough in the, practice, in, in the past. Also because this governance uh, was not in the, so much in the Commission's possibility to, to advise member states. Only after the crisis you know that the, the semester basically was born. And uh, I think that this is a tool which we should absolutely use more and try through this tool to achieve at most that we do everything possible that we do not arrive to the infringement. So we should combine those things and use the preventive absolutely as much as possible. But that will simply not change the fact that in some cases there will be no other possibility than opening the infringement and going to the court even. Uh, Just hold it there, Yanis, because I'm now going to bring in thank you. Uh, Jonathan to comment on any of the uh, questions, discussion that, that you may like to. Thank you. 
Um, tempting as it is to me to talk about uh, infractions, uh, I'm going to resist that. I, I'd like to ask about um, <laughs> the role of business, which um, surprised me by not featuring more in, in what you've had to say. Um, uh, I'm very business facing in what I do in my role, and I'm always a half glass full sort of person, so when I see encouraging signs of um, businesses thinking further ahead, trying to be more sustainable, seeing the potential gains to them on the bottom line and also wider benefits and so on, and actually trying to be progressive and, and, and so on, I'm very encouraged. And there is some of that activity. Um, why isn't there more, and how can we encourage companies to engage more in the agenda we're, we're discussing here? <laughs> Believe me that I tried everything to engage companies in that agenda, and uh, I'm probably, I'm, I'm, by the way, liked very much in business sector. So I'm approachable from business whenever it's possible, like I'm from the, from the civil society. So we have to talk to them and we have to engage with them. We have to try to explain. Uh, I'm just saying that in some cases I would also, you know, for for the handshake you need two hands, and uh, I would like to see the hand on the other side also sometimes. And on the other hand, uh, also if, if all my colleagues which are responsible in all the governments for economic policy would talk 10% as much of environment as I do about economic policies, we would reach far. Yeah, so I'm just trying to say that you need two sides. I'm absolutely keen and I have really also worked hard with my colleagues in DG that we would better understand, that we need to understand that there are also the needs of other parts of society. But uh, hand in hand, there is no other possibility. Okay, and do you want to just address the final question? Yeah, the final question was, uh, basically it's, uh, what we are proposing, it's not exactly the same as the ETS story. ETS, it's a classical market instrument, and you can believe us that we are the least happy persons in commission that we see how ETS was developing as we have seen. We have even reacted, but uh, obviously we have recognized that there is a market failure uh, because we withdraw some of the allowances from the market, which again, one is not happy because that's not any more market uh, measure. It is market measure, but not free market measure. So anyway, uh, we have addressed that at the beginning of the year with a new package. Sincerely hoping that this will improve uh, uh, the structural problems of the ETS, uh, uh, but I have to be frank that I'm not following that on a daily basis because it's not in my portfolio. And uh, I still believe that even uh, if uh, the first result was not too good, that we should absolutely stick to, to, to market measures also because uh, uh, obviously we have to look and try to find out uh, what went wrong. The things which we are proposing are more connected to uh, legal, legally binding targets. This is uh, another story. And what we will be proposing will be something where we will try to move those targets not to something which is unreachable and out of uh, scope of reality, but something which at least few member states today already are practicing in reality. And we would simply like that we move. And when it comes to waste handling, the most important thing which one needs to understand is that uh, you can really move very fast if you decide to do it and if you improve your governance properly. I have seen examples in the least developed parts of Europe like uh, uh, where we have the major problems with waste handling, south of Italy, Greece and so on, and I've seen really excellent examples coming from the cities where, where, or, or regions where they have practically in three, four years changed uh, the things from totally upside down. So it's possible. It's really the question either we decide to do it and it's really the question if we really collectively say there is no uh, place for waste in our society anymore, full stop. Okay, well that's a very good note to finish on. So thank you very much indeed, Yanesh. Um, all that's left to me, I'm not going to make any attempt to have any sort of summary of this enormously rich uh, discourse is uh, to thank our provost, not only for introducing everything, but for staying here uh, for the full lecture. Um, I know how much the provost of UCL has to do, and so that commitment of time is a large commitment. To thank 
uh, Jonathan Tilson for representing the minister here uh, so ably. Um, it would have been nice to have had the minister, obviously, but we know that ministers have lots to do. But above all, clearly, to thank Yanish. You will all know that we have at the moment um, an interesting discussion about the UK place in the European Union. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, comment at all on that tonight, but all I do know is that over the last five years, the European Union has been incredibly lucky to have Yanish as its Environment Commissioner. And anyone who cares about environment, resources, children, grandchildren in the UK has been incredibly lucky to have Yanish as EU Environment Commissioner. So thank you very much for that and for your speech tonight.